I'm really glad to be able to preach this morning. This is about my favorite Sunday to preach. Did you all get a good night's extra night's sleep last night? <laughs> you know, I really don't mind when people sleep when I preach. It's sleepwalking that really bothers me. <laughs> I heard a story about fishing once. This was a story about a, a man who went fishing every day and he came home not with just a few fish, but a whole cooler full of fish. His neighbor was a game warden, and uh, so the game warden said to him one day, I'd like to go fishing with you. The guy said, okay, I'm going tomorrow. Come on in with me. They got into the boat the next day, and they went out into the lake, and the man didn't have a pole. He didn't have anything but a cooler. Didn't even have a tackle box. He opened his cooler, took out a stick of dynamite, lit it, <laughs> threw it into the ocean, <laughs> and there were fish all over the place. He scoot, scooted up these fish, and the game warden said, you can't do that. The guy just laughed and zoomed to another part of the lake, took out another stick of dynamite, lit it, threw it out there, and the guy said, oh, I, I'm, you've done felonies? I mean, it's possession of dynamite is, is illegal, and unauthorized explosions is illegal. You've violated the law so many different ways. I'm going to have to take you in. And the guy just reached into his cooler, took out another stick of dynamite, and lit it, and watched it come down to the nub. He handed it to the game warden and said, what are you going to do, talk or fish? Well, when it comes to fishing for men, when it comes to evangelism, there's usually a whole lot more talk than there is evangelism. Let's look at Christ's early ministry. After his baptism, he went to be tempted, and then he came back to Galilee. Um, he went to Capernaum first. Capernaum is right at the top of the Sea of Galilee. If you imagine the Sea of Galilee right there, it's right up there at the top. And he preached and healed and did miracles there. And then, um, then he went to Nazareth. Nazareth is, this is the bottom of the, of the Sea of Galilee. It's about 10 miles this way, 10 miles towards the coast. And he um, taught in the synagogues there and, and did ministries. Um, this is where he started reading, the Spirit of the Lord is on me. Today, this has been fulfilled in your hearing. And he got, they, they tried to stone him. Then he went back to Capernaum, and he taught there. And it's a little difficult to place the chronological order of Christ's early ministry or Christ's ministry at all because the Jewish mind is not as chronological as we are. Um, so, but Luke seems to say that, that he healed Peter's mother at this point. And then he went on to the Sea of Galilee and called the disciples. Um, he called them to be fishers of men, and immediately they left their nets and their, and, their, and, their, and their father. We all know as Christians that we are supposed to be evangelists. Um, Matthew 28, you know the story, uh, the Great Commission. Jesus said, go, make disciples, teach, and baptize. In, uh, in John 15, let's look at this, John 15, 16 and 17. Jesus is talking about when the Holy Spirit will come upon people. John 15, 26 and 27. When the Counselor, that is the Holy Spirit, comes upon whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, you will testify about me, and you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. That's our job as Christians. And then, of course, Acts 1.8. All authority has been given to me. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You and I are called to spread the word, to be evangelists. Now, the gift of evangelism is uh, not what I'm talking about here. There is a specific gift of evangelism. If you remember in Ephesians 4, it says um, he called apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastor teachers. God called th these people for the good of the church. 
But really, there's only one evangelist in all of the Bible that's named as an evangelist. That's Philip in, in Acts chapter 8. And uh, Philip was the guy who went to Samaria, which was like going to Iran and preaching the gospel. I mean, there was true hatred between the people in Samar Samaria and the Jews. But he went there. And not only that, as he was preaching, many, many people came to the Lord through him. And the Holy Spirit said to, uh, said to Philip, go down to Gaza. And so he went down to Gaza, and there he met the, the Ethiopian eunuch. And uh, he went up to the guy's chariot and said, do you know what you're reading? And the eunuch says, no, I don't know. I don't understand it. So Philip shared with him, and he became a, a believer right there. Now, that's the gift of evangelism. And I don't think very many people have that particular gift. I know I don't have that gift. Um, I've known people who, you know, almost could walk by somebody and their shadow would fall on the person and the person would drop to their knees. You know, I mean, not quite that much. But, <laughs> but I've known people who were very, very bold right from the beginning with sharing Christ. Uh, that was not me. I'll tell you about that in a minute. I know people who were willing to share at the drop of a hat. And again, that's not my own story either. And I've known people who just had many, many people come to the Lord through them. You know, and I've had a few people here and there that have come to the Lord. But it's not a gift that I possess. I don't think it's a gift that very many people possess. I grew up in a Christian home in a, in a very godly family. Um, I can never remember not believing in my head everything that's in the Bible from a very small child. I went to Moody Bible Institute. I went to Biola University uh, College then. And um, by the time I was a senior, at Biola, I was just sort of floating on the surface of Christianity. I wasn't really practicing anything. I still believed it in my head. But I wasn't really reading or praying or... Um, I went to a lot of Campus Crusade meetings um, because I was a senior at that time and unmarried. And so I went to Campus Crusade meetings for the right reason, right? <laughs> So I knew a little bit about crusade, but I was just sort of floating on the, on the surface of Christianity. And fortunately, you know, you hear about people falling into bad company. I fell into good company. <laughs> I met some people in Easter time of my senior year who really were living for God and, and they had a vital message to share and it absolutely changed my life. And so between Easter and when I graduated, I had to change everything that I had planned to do. And so I decided I'd join Campus Crusade for Christ since I wanted to do something for God. So I joined Campus Crusade for Christ. Now there's a problem with me joining Campus Crusade for Christ at that time because I had never shared Christ with anybody. I had argued with some people. <laughs> but in terms of sharing the gospel with people, I had never really done that. I mean, as part of service projects for Moody and Biola, I had taught Sunday school class and done mission things and everything like that. But again, I was floating, you know, I wasn't there. And all at once, I was expected to share Jesus Christ with people. You know, we went door to door, it scared me to death. We, uh, we, we went to the beach to share Christ. Now, I've got to share with you what I look like at the beach. You're laughing. <laughs> There's a song that describes me very, very well, me at the beach. It's a song that is one of the 30 pop songs or, or whatever that have sold 10 million copies. This is the song, A Whiter Shade of Pale. And I was quickly turning into a redder shade of burn. Uh, we went to campuses and talked to people, just walked up to people and talked to people. Now, there's a verse in the scripture 
that is very, very important in my life. The verse is, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it's God who works in you both to will and to do his good, his good pleasure. Now, um, this is talking to Christians. This is not saying, talking about working out your, the, the salvation that gets you into heaven kind of thing. Paul is talking to Christians here. Salvation can be, in the scripture, can be either the, the time when you do come to Christ, or it can be the time when we get to heaven and it says, Paul talks about the coming salvation. He's talking to Christians. He's talking about the coming salvation when we're freed from this body of sin that plagues us. It can also mean the, the time in between when we are working out our, our, our rescuing, our salvage, our salvation from the world around us and from what's in our heads. And so Paul says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Well, those first couple of years with Campus Crusade, I knew the fear and trembling part pretty well. And it was very, very strange because I didn't like it when I started it. But somewhere along the line, I started enjoying talking to people about Jesus Christ. It was a long process. But after several years, I found out that I enjoyed it. Now, I have to tell you that I've been trying to share Christ with everybody that I can think of for the last 30 years or so. But there's a time when I meet somebody and the Holy Spirit says to me, You're, you need to share with this person. And I get the collie wobbles right then. I get, <laughs> I get this thing that says, no, I don't want to do that. And I sort of arm wrestle with God for a while. I mean, that still happens to me. But I, most of the time, share with the people that, I, that the Holy Spirit tells me to share. I like fishing. You know, I really enjoy fishing. Um, I'm not crazy about arm wrestling, wrestling with God, but once you get past it, I found it to be a, a, a very enjoyable experience. As a matter of fact, when I share Christ with somebody, it just lights up my whole, <clears throat> my whole day. And on a side note, you get to meet very interesting stories when you're talking to people about the Lord. I remember talking to, uh, well, I was on a flight with my family from the East Coast out here a few years ago, and it was a midnight flight, red-eye flight, and I was sitted, sitting next to a very well-dressed gentleman, and again, I got the collie wobbles, I wrestled with God, and finally I asked him if he had a um, religious background, and he said, yes, I'm an Orthodox Jew. And it was very interesting. Um, we went into the back of the plane so I didn't disturb my family for the rest of the talk night, and we talked for three hours on that airplane. And the man didn't come to Christ, but I had never talked with an Orthodox Jew before. And I wouldn't have, I mean, he wasn't wearing a yarmulke, or, or I mean, I didn't know who he was or what he was doing. But that was a, a, a really great story. And I wish he would have come to Christ, and maybe he has since, I don't know. I remember right, another airplane, I was, uh, right, I was sitting next to a woman and I asked her if she had a relationship with Christ and, and uh, she said that she did. Um, we were flying to Reno. She said that, uh, that she had been on her way to ski passing through Reno and had spent her, the change in her purse uh, on the slot machines and she won $25,000. <laughs> And so she was flying back to Reno because the casinos were asking her to come back and giving her free everything. <laughs> and she was on her way to ski again. Um, those kinds of things don't happen typically except if you share, try to share Christ with somebody. And then you get these wonderful conversations. Uh, they're a lot better than the magazines that are in airplanes. You know, there's typically two uh, magazines in airplanes. There's the one that is full of uh, stuff that doesn't interest you, and the other is full of stuff that you don't need to buy. <laughs> so to sort of sum up what, what I've said, now don't worry, I'm not getting ready to stop yet. <laughs> we still have a ways to go. But to sum up, in terms of witnessing, 
God has taught me to do and to will his good pleasure. That is to share Christ with people. This is not something that I wanted. It's not something that I looked for. It sort of snuck up on me. It took a long time with my arm firmly twisted behind my back. And then this is the thing I want you to hear. If I could learn this thing, there isn't a person in this room that can't learn it. Paul might have been, the, or he was, he says, the greatest sinner. I am undoubtedly the most reluctant witness in the history of the world. So I'd like to share with you a few hints about how to share Christ with the people around you. The first thing that you need to do is you need, need to memorize a simple salvation story. You need to talk about God. You need to talk about human beings. You need to talk about Jesus. Then you need to talk about the person you're talking to. When you talk to somebody about God, John 3.16 is a great verse. For God so loved the world. You can talk about God's love. The second one, you need to talk about the human condition. Romans 3.23, 6.23. All of sin and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. Sometimes you need to sit on this one for a while because a lot of people, about 80% of the American public believes in a life after death. And almost all of them believe that they're going to a better place without having any relationship with Jesus Christ. And so you need to talk about that one. Then you need to talk about Jesus Christ. And the verse that I use for that is 2 Corinthians 5.24. 21. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Then you need to talk about the person that you're talking to. As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, even to those who believed in his name. John 1.12. There's two Collywobble places when you're talking with somebody. The first one is the one I've talked about when you first make that first little opening statement. The second one is when you talk to the person about his response. You get the collie wobbles every time, at least I do. Wouldn't you like to ask Jesus Christ to come into your life? I mean, that's where they come. And the second thing that you need to do is you need to pray for the people around you. Pray for everybody in sight. I, the way what I do for prayer is I pray David Letterman's way. Top ten things. And so I pray, at any, uh, I have a lot of top ten lists. I praise God for, top, for, for ten things. Or I say thank you for the things that you've given me. Or these are ten people that are sick that need to know you, uh, that, that need, need your healing. Or these are ten of my neighbors who don't know you that, that need you. And the reason I do that is because... I don't know about you, but when I pray, I can get to maybe one or two, and then my mind is off zinging around someplace. You know, I mean, have you seen that movie, Up? The villain has these dogs that he puts a little thing on their throat so that they can talk. And the dogs will be talking back and forth very alertly and cogently with, uh, with whoever they're talking to, and all at once they go, squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> Well, when I do that, I come back to, let me see, three. Okay, what's, uh, yeah, okay, what am I doing here? And I eventually get to ten. I might see a few squirrels, but I get there. <laughs> and so I think it's important to pray for the, the people around us. Um, then I think it's also very important to just get to know folks. Um, now, I'm not talking about sharing Jesus with them yet. That'll come next. But get to know people. Um, there's a lot of people around that, that you meet um, that all you've got to do is get to know them a little bit and you'll have a platform from which to share. People are getting sick and in serious situations. That's a good time to get to know them. Um, I had a neighbor whose father was dying. I took him a jar of homemade jelly and ask him if I could pray with him, and he said no. <laughs> it does happen. 
but that kind of thing is, is a beginning, see. Um, I like football, basketball, baseball. I invite people over to watch the games with me. I enjoy gardening, so I trade flower bulbs back and forth with people in my neighborhood. Um, there was a man in our neighborhood who, who uh, was from Russia. He didn't have a Bible. I gave him a Bible. Um, you can invite people for ice cream or for dinner. If you like to go fishing, take them with you. Don't take any dynamite. <laughs> Offer to help little things that the, per the person's doing. A lot of times, four hands is better than two. Um, all of these things are, are, are doable. And you and I can do these things, and it opens the doors for us to share Christ with people. One thing that I've, I want to try, I haven't tried yet, is I would like to have a neighborhood barbecue when it gets a little warmer. Um, if you're sharing with somebody and it's a one-time thing, you have to pursue, proceed, uh, proceed differently. I mean, you can get to know them a little bit, ask them about their family. That's a very good way, way to talk, start talking to people about the Lord because um, I remember um, we had a, a man that came uh, to work on our internet. And so, you know, um, he was working on it and I was handing him tools and talking to him, the kind of thing that didn't interrupt his work. And so I asked him about his, um, his family and, and I told him about my family and that conversation went on for a while. And then he said, he told, told me about his daughter who was in Klamath Falls in an intervention program. And, and so I, ask if I could pray for that daughter, and, and we talked back and forth, and I had just a really good conversation, a good time to talk to him about, about the Lord. Um, if I'm in an airplane or something, or in a place where um, I'm, I'm going to be with somebody for just a few minutes or even five minutes, I remember what Bill Bright said when I was on Crusade staff. He said, if I'm in a situation alone with a person, I feel I need to talk to that person about Christ. Well, I've tried to do that. Um, I remember those words, and that just sort of stuck with me. I remember uh, we, when we bought our house in uh, Medford here in Central Point, we had to change out the carpet, and so the carpet layers came. And uh, I hate to admit this, but they came for two days. The first day, I did the arm wrestling collie wobble thing with God. And I didn't talk to him. I mean, I talked with him about the 49ers, that kind of thing. And when they came back the second day, I knew that I had to talk with him. And I, I talked with him, had a really, really great conversation with him. And we prayed together, and, and it was just, it was good. Um, you might get flack when you do this, but... Turn with me to Philippians chapter 1, verse 29. Paul says, <clears throat> Philippians 1, 29, For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. I mean, when I think of what's happening in the Muslim world, what we go through when we get a little rejection is not even worth talking about. But it still hurts, doesn't it? So that sometimes does happen. Um, you remember when Paul and Barnabas were in, in Lydia and, they were, and, and Paul was stoned? Um, after that, happened, Paul's response to getting stoned and left for dead was um, that they rejoiced because they, counted, they were counted worthy to suffer for Jesus Christ, suffer, suffer shame for Jesus Christ. Forget about the stoning. You know, when that happens, we need to count it worth, count, be glad and rejoice because we're counted worthy to serve Christ. To, to suffer for Jesus Christ in a very limited way that we have to suffer. The fourth thing to do, and this is where you talk about Jesus, is simply talk about 
Jesus. The best way of doing that that I found is asking questions. Jesus did that, this in John 3. Nicodemus, are you a leader in the in are you Israel's teacher, Nicodemus, and you don't understand what I'm saying? He did it in chapter 4 to the Samaritan woman. Would you get, please give me a drink, to, uh, a drink of water? He did it in John 5 with the man by the pool of Bethsaida when he said, um, do you want to get well? Asking questions is a, 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 just a great way to, to, to get to know people and to be able to talk to them about Jesus Christ. And again, family is a great place to start. But the thing that I use more than anything uh, when I'm trying to start a conversation is I say, do you have a religious background? Now, this has a lot of advantages because you're asking somebody to talk about themselves. <laughs> and yet, that's, you know, have you ever listened to adults talk? One guy will share his experience and then another guy will share his experience and, and it just goes around. Well, that's how guys talk anyhow. But, uh, but that's the way we talk. And it's, it's also a good way of talking because when he shares his experience, then um, the human social contract says that you get to share your experience. It's a, a, a great way to find out openness. Sometimes people say, uh, yeah, uh, no, I don't have any religious, and put, pull a bank as you know, you know. <laughs> and that's okay. But um, it also works for both yes or no. If they say, no, I don't have any in any religious background, then you can say, uh, do you mind if I show you mine? <laughs> or if they say yes, then you can go from there. And almost always, um, people are interested in talking about their religious background. And it just opens the door to be able to talk to them about Jesus Christ. Only once in my life have I ever had to stand in front of a judge. When I was a teenager trying to be Dale Earnhardt Jr. <laughs> I hit a bridge <laughs> with my folks' car, and so I had to go before the judge. Um, now imagine this experience. Oh, for those of you from Grass Valley, that's the back bridge between Grass Valley and Nevada City. I was hanging over the water. <laughs> uh, Imagine a court scene. Imagine the judge is the person that you're talking to. That's the person that is going to make the decision. And Jesus is being tried. The Holy Spirit is the defense attorney. And you and I are on the witness stand. We are asked to, to give character witness for Jesus Christ. Who is he? What has he said? What did he do? What is my relationship, your relationship to Jesus Christ? And you and I, many, many times every day, have the opportunity to witness for Jesus Christ. Many times we're silent. We need to witness. We need to understand that the judge, that is the person we're talking to, is going to act on our silence or on our, or on our witness, on our testimony. Now, let me ask you, why is it that witnessing is so hard for us? I mean, it is. I can remember when I was trying my knees knocking together. Um, well, first of all, we fight a battle against rulers, authorities, powers of this dark world, and spiritual forces in the heavenly realms. I mean, now we don't fight against Satan, you and I. We fight against his minions. Uh, the minions of Satan are not little yellow guys that do cute things. <laughs> they are terrible, terrible, terrible beings. And that's where our battle is. Why is it I mean, why can we talk about a new car or a new job or anything, 49ers? Why is it we can talk about that stuff and it's so hard to talk about Jesus Christ? Well, there it is. We have, we have a battle in our minds going on. I think we're also 
afraid to talk sometimes because we don't think that we have the answers. Um, but that shouldn't bother us. I mean, many times somebody will say, ask you or me something about something not related to Jesus Christ, and we say, I don't know, I'll tell you when I get back to you. That works for Jesus Christ, too. A lot of times I think we're afraid we're going to make a mistake, that we don't know enough, that, we're, that we're, we don't know enough doctrine to share Jesus Christ, that we're going to make a mistake. To see the amazing thing about Romans 8.28 is that it says that God's got our mistakes covered. God's got our mistakes covered. He works all things together. That includes my mistakes and your mistakes. And I've made a few, and you have too. But God works all things together. So we don't have to worry about making a mistake when we, when we share Christ with somebody. I mean, I share this with, my son, with a Sunday school class. I've got to share this story with you. This is uh, a story that I heard a man, he, he said... Uh, a few years ago, I was at a navigator's meeting, or let me go back. He said that when he was at, in college, he was, he was driving from one place to another, and he, and he was driving on a Volkswagen bug, and he had the, the seat and the back seat totally full of his things, and he was driving down the road, and it was raining like crazy, and he saw a guy hitchhiking on the side of the road. He wanted to share with a guy. He must have had the gift of evangelism. <laughs> He wanted to share with the guy, but he didn't have room in his car, so he pulled off to the side of the road, waited for the guy to come running up to his car. He took a track and whited it up and threw it over the top of the car and took off. <laughs> now, that's a mistake. <laughs> Don't do this. <laughs> but the guy said a few years later, he was at a navigator's meeting, and a guy in the meeting got up to give his testimony, and he said, you know, a couple of years ago, I was standing by the side of the road, and it was raining like crazy, and this idiot <laughs> pulled up. Well, I ran up to the car to get into the car. He rolled down his window. It was raining like crazy, like I said. He wadded up a track and threw it over the car and, I, and took off. And I thought, what? I'm not going to look at that. And he kicked it. And then he thought, well, I might as well go see what the guy has to say. And he read it and became a Christian. I don't advise that. <laughs> but you see... You and I can make mistakes, and God cleans up after us. He works all things together for good. Now, I want to sort of depart from what I'm talking about and say there are maybe some people here who feel guilty about things that you've done in the past. I mean, I've heard people say that they have no regrets. I think those people are not telling the truth <laughs> because we all have things that we regret bad things that we've done. And sometimes we allow Satan to make us feel guilty about those things. I mean, once you've confessed them, it's not God making you feel guilty. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just. He forgives our sins and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And it says he, he, he removes our, our sins far from us as from the east as from the west. So... If you feel guilty about something, and I often do myself, just understand that God works that out for your good and for my good. We don't have to worry about that kind of thing. We are unreasonably afraid of rejection, too. I mean, we all are that way. Uh, if you're as old as I am, you can remember the 70s. You can the ladies, you can remember beehive hairdos. And guys, you can remember bell-bottom pants. Kashoosh, kashoosh, kashoosh. Why did we wear that stuff? Why don't we wear it now? Well, we wore it then because we didn't want to get rejected. That's what everybody was wearing. We don't wear it now because we don't want to get rejected. That's what nobody's wearing. <laughs> we don't like rejection. Acts 14, 22, Paul and Barnabas, it says, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Well, in America, we don't have really that much to do, but we do have to face the possibility of the hard and painful thing of being rejected. Fishing is, 
is hard. I mean, it isn't now. I like to fish, and it's you know, very enjoyable to find a stream, put my fly out on the water, and I mean, there's no difficulty to it. I have to cast every once in a while I mean, and haul in the fish, of course. But uh, in the day when Christ called the disciples, it was difficult. They were fishing with a net that's maybe 12 feet across and heavily weighted all the way around this, this, the, the edge of it, and you'd throw this thing out, and you'd let it sink for a while, and then you'd pull a cord, and it would grab the bottom of it, and you'd pull in those weights, that wet net, and whatever fish you caught. You did that for 12 hours. It was difficult. Well, being a fisher for men is difficult, too. We have to go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. But you see, Christ didn't die so that we'd be comfortable. Christ didn't die so that we could have a, an easy life. We have to do difficult things for the kingdom of God. And I'd like to share with you something that C.S. Lewis wrote that sort of, I think, impresses the importance of going fishing. C.S. Lewis, this is his essay, The Weight of Glory. He says, every human being is in the process of becoming a noble being, noble beyond imagination, or else, alas, a vile being beyond redemption. The dullest and most uninteresting person you can talk to may one day be a creature which, if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to fall down and worship it, or else a horror and a corruption such as you now meet only if in, in nightmares. There are no ordinary people. It's immortals that we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. Immortal horrors are everlasting splendors. And it's our job to witness to those people. I saw a sign once that said, you catch them, God will clean them. Well, there's a, there is truth to that, but it also is untrue in the sense that we don't catch anybody. All we do is witness. It's up to God to catch them. And as we witness, through this puny little thing that God has asked us to do, he catches people. People come into the kingdom. So I say to you, let's go fishing. Join with me in prayer.